Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for October the 23rd, 2020. This is episode number 29. Today, we'll be talking about Tesla records a record quarter, the Tesla FSD beta is out, and the GMC Hummer EV Super Truck has been revealed. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, longtime EV owner and uh, Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all your usual podcast platforms. And so welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. So the big product news of the week is the launch of the GMC Hummer EV. Yep, that SUV that was supposed to be revealed in all <laughs> super truck glory on May the 20th has finally been shown to the world. The actual event, I have to say, was a little anticlimactic. Basically, GM released a five and a half minute video of a computer generated truck doing mostly off road things. Uh, the heavy lifting for the truck's debut was actually done by YouTubers, including uh, Jason Fenske from the uh, Engineering Explained channel and John Redinger, among others. Uh, they had access to an early prototype, a full-size vehicle that looks pretty much what the uh, production ve version will look like. However, while it may be functional to some extent, it's not an actual pre-production vehicle because with just more than uh, a little more than a year before first the deliveries are slated to begin, they haven't actually gotten to the stage of development yet. So uh, we can talk about why I think that's a good thing a little later. But to first, uh, let's get to some specs and get some, some features out of the way. Uh, okay, so the GMC Hummer EV, uh, or at least the top spec of it, is an all-wheel drive pickup truck with a five-foot bed, a removable glass roof, a four-wheel steering uh, driven by three motors that makes a thousand horsepower and about a thousand pound feet of motor torque. GM says it makes uh, 11,500 pound feet of torque, but that's wheel torque, which takes gear ratios and wheel size into account and is kind of misleading because we always look at motor, motor torque when we read about cars. So we'll go with a, a thousand uh, pound feet of torque, which actually uh, Jason Fenske of the uh, Engineering Explained. Uh, he got the gear ratios and things from GM and figured it all out, and that's what, what he came up with. Uh, so it can, so the, uh, the Hummer EV can hustle from a standstill to 60 miles an hour in about three seconds. It can go over 350 miles on a charge. It can also accept 350 kilowatts of peak current when you're recharging, a DC fast charging. Um, at that rate, uh, which you'll likely only see when, below, when you're below a 50% state of charge, it can add about 100 miles of range in 10 minutes, which is pretty good. So uh, the price for the Edition 1, the initial trucks to be built, is $112,595. Ouch. But unless you already put down your thousand or your $100 deposit, uh, forget about it, because they all sold out within a few minutes. Uh, that means you, you'll you only have to pay $99,995 and probably have a choice of colors besides the special white that only the Edition 1 gets. So unfortunately, while you get to save about $13,000, you'll also have to wait an extra year because it's only set to begin deliveries of that lower trim in the fall of 2022. Uh, there are also a couple of cheaper trim levels with uh, only two drive motors and fewer features and later delivered dates. The cheapest one will be uh, $79,995 and that will only be available in 2024. So Tom, uh, why don't you kick things off by uh, talking about why this price isn't bad, even though it's significantly higher than the Rivian R1T and Tesla Cybertruck, which uh, should be its biggest electric pickup truck competitors. Yeah, so first of all, one of the things that um, we have to consider is that it's not just going to be competing against electric vehicles. Uh, you know, we went over this a little bit with the Volkswagen ID4, where people were comparing it to Model 3, Mustang Mach E. And, you know, one of the points that I made was that, you know, this isn't that they're not necessarily its prime competitors. Its prime competitors are the RAV4 EV, the Honda CRV. It's going to take sales from gasoline competitors more so than it would electric competitors. And I think the Hummer EV is the same in that respect. 
Yes, there'll be some cross shopping. They're always cross shopping between Rivian and Tesla, but this is going to go after a different type of buyer. Now, remember, when the original H1 came out back in, I think it was 95 or 96, it was over $100,000. And, and GM sold it. As, as many of them as they could. They sold a ton of them. It was like proof that people wanted to buy these, these type of vehicles. So that's why they went and redesigned it and kind of toned it down and used the Tahoe uh, you know, frame and, and uh, made the H2, which was not nearly as capable uh, an all-wheel drive vehicle as the H1, but it did cost less. It was That brought the price down somewhere between 70,000 to 85,000. Most of them sold in that range. So even 20 years ago, this was a seventy, eighty thousand dollars vehicle. So, I don't know why people, and it does seem like people are really surprised that the cheapest version is going to be eighty thousand uh, dollars. That doesn't surprise me at all. I, I fully expected this to be like GM's electric halo vehicle. This like you know um, uh, brute force. Uh, you know, no holds barred, can do anything vehicle, and you pay for that. I mean, it's packed with technology. It's got a thousand horsepower, thousand pound feet of torque. It's going to be one of the most capable electric vehicle, or, or probably the most capable all wheel drive electric vehicle um, available. And uh, you know, you're going to pay for that. So, you know, I, 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 I look at what pickup trucks cost these days. Go to a dealership and look at a fully loaded Ford F-150. It's like 75 grand. So, right. you know, it, it, th this vehicle with what it has uh, appears that it's priced right, in my opinion. I think GM is going to do okay with them. This isn't going to be a, you know, 50,000 unit per year vehicle. Uh, you know, I think when the silver, when the all electric Silverado comes out eventually, that that's what would be in that, you know, they're high volume seller, right. but um, you know the ve I'm I'm very I'm pleased with the vehicle. I think the pricing is where is appropriate for it. Now that said, I'm not, certainly not pleased with how GM rolled this out. Another kind of a launch fail, like the Lyric was, in, in my opinion. I, you know, I it 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 really is is mind boggling to me how poorly GM does with these new electric vehicle reveals, almost as if. They're really not that interested in getting people excited about them, you know, and, and uh, you know, t terrible launch. And then the fact that we've got to wait as long as we do for this. I mean, that this vehicle isn't going to be available for a full year. The less expensive vehicles, the least expensive vehicle for more than two and a half years. That's the fail that I see. I think the vehicle is a really cool vehicle. I don't think it's overpriced for what it's going to offer, but. GM's the way GM rolled this out and the timing of it, I think, is the really, the really unfortunate part here. Okay. Well, I, I was thinking, personally, I was thinking it was going to be in the in the uh, hundred thousand dollar kind of area because it's go, it goes three hundred fifty miles. So uh, when they were when GM first rolled out its Altium battery plants, it said it could, would go up to two hundred kilowatt hours, and so I, I assume it has a two hundred kilowatt hour battery, which obviously is not going to be cheap. And um, so GM is not saying exactly how big the battery is. Uh, the, uh, it is over 200 kilowatt hours though, uh, just slightly. So doing the math, uh, again, Jason Fenske of Engineer Explained did the math on it and he, they figure it's between 202 kilowatt hours and 218.9 kilowatt hours. And look, if, if you're looking at watching this on YouTube, man, uh, that looks that's a great shot on the beach with the roof off man i'm loving this thing really it looks uh i find it looks a bit more lift a little more athletic than the originals hey kyle uh so kyle connor from the out of spec motoring youtube channels and one lap channel has joined us and so what do you think of this i don't think we've spoken about this Hello, good morning. Sorry, I am late to the show. I just rolled out of bed. Somehow I must be on Colorado time. So, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the dog ate my homework. Give a note to right, the teacher. Come right, on. Yeah, well, you know, normally my internal clock, I don't even set alarms. I just, I'm up at 6.30 and today, wow, 10 a.m. Sorry, guys. I really apologize. I would guess I was right. up late editing. Anyway, uh, Hummer EV. Specs look great. Uh, however... Uh, I think when, when I jumped on, Tom was just saying, what is GM doing with these launches? I mean, this is such a fail. Uh, you know, we were sitting there watching this live stream and we're, we're so excited and, and they play this five minute and 30 second like 
ad basically and then we're like okay great now it's gonna start and we'll see it on stage and see people stuff and right. then it never came <laughs> so we're like come on uh honestly i i don't think the price is too high i agree with tom on this i think it's too high for normal people but keep in mind who's going to be wanting to buy this car it's all those big macho crossfitters that are down in miami that's angry at the car next to you and they will spend the money i mean these guys are uh, you know there's a lot of money in the bank look first editions already sold out pre-orders so uh you know that just shows they priced it right GMC has Denali as their premium brand. These trucks are eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollars as is, and they sell you know tons of them. And then they have AT4, which is their off-roading brand, which is uh, you know a little bit lower price point, but very capable trucks. This is sort of a blend of both of those, and then higher performance. I think they can justify the $112,000 price. Again, people buy cars not with their brains. They buy them with their hearts. And uh, this is a, an emotional decision. This is someone who wants to pretend that they're invading a third world country and they're giant Humvees. <laughs> and then, you know, it happens to be electric. So that's my take on it. And one thing I want to point out, I mentioned uh, two or three of the podcasts ago that I was at um, doing dealer training at a Jeep dealership. And while I was there, somebody signed the contract and bought a Jeep Cherokee Trackhawk. Hmm. And I think right. it was hundred and three thousand six hundred dollars. So right. you know, yeah. to Kyle's point, yeah, there's people out there with the coin to buy hundred thousand dollar vehicles. And you know, while the trackhawk is a really cool vehicle, and I know I'm electric vehicle biased, put these two vehicles next to each other. And tell me which one you would buy. You know, right. I, you know, I don't even think it's close yeah. of a decision. So, you know, in that regards, if you have the coin, this is is going to be a compelling offer. It's a monster, man. It's got thirty five inch t- wheel tires on it, and optional thirty seven inch tires. <laughs> and it'll do like a 10 second quarter mile, probably like ten and a half seconds or something. You know, yeah, I we, mean, <laughs> well. I think it'll be a bit closer to 11 and a half, maybe. All right. Know. Well, let's see. I'm exaggerating how, 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 a little. I know it's zero to 60 in three seconds. So, you know. Yeah. In, in, in what, in, oh, I almost said it, the WTF mode. Uh, what is it? What is it called? Watts, Watts to Freedom mode. Yeah. <laughs> Watts to Freedom. We uh, need to talk about Watts to Freedom. Okay. Let's talk so about do, Watts to Freedom. All of, do you guys know what Watts to Freedom does? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just explain. So the car normally in your my mode set to the adrenaline setting is four seconds, zero to 60. This is on the the edition one. Mm -hmm. When you go to WTF mode, uh, which is all what we're going to call it, it (laughs) uh, (laughs) lowers the suspension two inches, stiffens the dampers, typical launch control stuff, nothing fancy here. But then it vibrates the seats, plays music in the speakers, goes all crazy, (laughs) lights start flashing, and then you rock it off. And it's like, oh my God, can I just go from light to light really fast without all this drama? (laughs) It's a lot of theater. Sure. Yeah, there's no way to go zero to 60 in three seconds without the drama. And this is all software that they can code in and code out, but th- right. there's been no indication. So all you would hear during my week of testing with the Hummer EV <laughs> is just lots of loud bassy noises and lights flashing right. pulling out of my driveway every day because uh, that's how you got to drive. Right. I guess I guess they that's their version of like how how to compete with ludicrous mode. You know, they had to come up yes. with something that was uh, you know even wilder. So what, they couldn't come up with a more wild name. So let's give like you know audible and um, vibrations and, and feedback. You know, so I'm surprised it's it didn't have gimmick. like the. I'm surprised that instead of that, Kyle, it didn't have like like a loud, um, you know, gasoline engine, like like record like the core of that sound and pipe right. that in, and right. and and that that's your watch to freedom. But uh, yeah, that yeah. would just, be really. Just, bad. It's going to be a super fast vehicle. That's that that that's mm, my point. Right. I mean, you know, you know, it, it it's gonna it does everything. It can it can go anywhere with that with that air suspension. It's got like whatever eighteen inches of clearance or something crazy. Right. Um, you know, it's it's got that really cool. I love the the camera system is what I love. I mm. love the fact that there's cameras under the vehicle, so you can kind of like 
watch the possum as you run it over, you know, <laughs> and tra- going over rivers and stuff, you know, but I mean, I'm sure it's for, for clearance and all, but, um, right. and I'm not advocating, advocating <laughs> running over animals. I meant going over like it was already dead on the road. It was roadkill and you rode over it. Um, uh, but, yeah. um, so, you know, do you know, so do you know anything more about the cameras? Like I heard it has like 18 different yeah, views. 18, 18, 18, 18 yeah. cameras, including the two underneath that have right. little special, uh, uh, squirter jets because of course they're always going to be dirty and they said we've yeah. thought of that you'll have some little squirty i'm surprised they haven't put uh, they've got three windshield wipers they should have a couple of right. wipers on the on the cameras as well <laughs> little to keep them clean. <laughs> <laughs> three windshield wipers. i don't but even this get is that. nothing new they, they've had this little uh high pressure uh water squirter at cameras right. like on the back of the chevy bolt all of the ones with yeah. the camera rear view mirror yeah. Um, since I joined a little late, I just wanted to make sure we talked about Crab Walk. Have you? Oh, we haven't yet. No, not yet. We but haven't. No. I, I just we gotta to talk want, about Crab Walk. I, I just want to mention one thing first. More about the cameras. So yeah. there's. A, I just wanted to add that there's a, a couple on the bottom sides of the mirrors. So I guess you can you see if you're on a trail, you can kind of see, see what kind of clearance you have if you're going by like mm. a stump or something. That's kind of cool. And there's one that's uh, on the bed of the truck, so you can watch whatever you have in the back. Uh, you know, if you have, I don't know, if people carry their dogs in the back down where you all live but it happens here <laughs> i don't think it's i'm not even sure if it's legal yeah, thankfully do it doesn't happen here yeah um yeah but if you have a load in the back you can kind of keep an eye on that and so that's kind of cool so yeah uh kyle uh just, yeah uh, the cameras are cool it's very similar to i think their other pickup truck range of cameras um and also like a range rover has all this stuff i didn't okay. see anything with way depth sensing so i imagine uh it doesn't have that but i always thought that was a great feature in um you know sort of these premium off-roading segment like a range rover where it tells you how deep the water is that you're fording or how mm. deep the water is in the starbucks drive through more yeah. accurately more important uh you know anyway the uh, crab walk mode this yeah. is pretty cool so uh, it can go diagonal, which we had suspected from, uh, you know, I think we originally were hoping it would go full sideways. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, it's just uh, utilizing that rear wheel steer system up to 10 degrees of angle to crab yeah. sideways. And uh, I've already committed and I promise to do this. I will spend a whole day only getting around in crab mode. <laughs> it's be just, a slow zig- day. just zigzagging down the street. Yes, it-, <laughs> it will cause traffic jams. Sorry, officer, the car is broken. You know, I'm just going to be driving around only in crab mode. It's going to be a video on the Inside EVs YouTube channel. It's going to cause a whole bunch of, you know, traffic situation, but it'll be worth it. But you can also change the direction of those back wheels, I guess, at, I th- believe at lower speed. So you can also make a super tight turning radius. Yeah. Well, yeah, super yeah, yeah, tight yeah. for a, a huge vehicle like this. Yeah, yeah, that will happen automatically. Uh, so this is a technology that GM had, I think, 20 or 25 years ago called Quadrasteer. Maybe it yes. wasn't that long, but yeah. And those trucks are still very sought after. And there is such a huge benefit to having rear wheel steering. I mean, most modern luxury cars have it now, a 7 Series, an S-Class, even Porsche GT3s have passive rear wheel steer in some case. Yeah. Uh, it just transforms the way and what you can do with a car. Yeah, with that, and also it has torque vectoring on, on the rear axle, so that should the handling should be pretty interesting, actually. Yeah, they spend you know the development time on it. Um, oh, just one more thing about the the W2F uh, Watch to Freedom mode. It also uh, gives more. It turns the fans or the circulation up of the coolant, so it gives you more cooling going on as well. It kind of prepares the vehicle for that. Um, can we talk about the 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 uh, interior just for a sec? Because I, I kind of love this part about it. It's like, you know, if you look at the, some of the shots of the interior, it's kind of like chunky, hunky. But if you look close, it's got this like moon theme. And you can tell it's like the regolith kind of color gray. It's kind of, it's not the most exciting color exactly. But like the speaker grills has like the sea of tranquility where they were, you know, they landed on the moon. It's got like this weird pattern showing it. Um, and it's got a few kind of, the dead pedal has like a astronaut boot print. Yeah, there's a sea of tranquility if you're watching this on YouTube. Yeah, it's just kind of bizarre. Uh, man, that looks cool. Um, yeah, anyone have any thoughts about the interior? 
It's pretty industrial. I mean, we don't really have trucks like this over here, so um, I'm still I'm still bemused in a kind of happy days of just why why make this car? Um, but that's a cultural difference. That's fine. Uh, sure. So I don't it, think it's a cultural difference, Martin. I'm in full <laughs> agreement with you. Like why would anyone need this? Yeah, uh, just, but uh, mm. you know, inside, I'll be fair and call it industrial. I mean, it's not. It's not been beaten with the ugly stick. I'm sure we had a picture up here a minute ago. But, I mean, things like the vents and just, like, it, like they've just gone at it with a ruler and gone, big rectangle, that'll do, that's right. the air vent. Like, that's right. the style. I get it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm tongue-in-cheek. Uh, I get it. I get the car's meant to look like this. It's right. just, there's just so much room to do so like how big should we make the vents well how big do you want them like you know how big should the center console be well we could put a third seat in there but no. how big now why that's that's a legacy thing why is that because the original hum v had like like a transmission there like that's a hangover oh, yeah. from the original car uh, the original military vehicle but surely that was there for a a reason like that must well, have been I think some... it's there just just for a sense of normality for most of these people uh, right you yeah. know you get into a bench truck and typically this feels unpremium to us uh, okay console to gotcha. americans is a premium or you know you look at f-150 you pay for the option of the center console even though you don't need it uh, oh, okay. but you know the the shifter is very legacy of hummer h2 this was like a chevrolet tahoe but just really chunky and everything mm. was big and you needed two hands to move the shifter and like you know it's just a everything was just like tonka toy and yeah, i think they kept tonka. a little bit of that same approach here but it's also more refined than h2 or h3 so yeah. i think they on paper have accomplished a good job with the interior but in reality you don't sit on paper you sit in an interior that looks like this and it it just looks like things are going to impale you everywhere it's huge uh, yeah and, and also so much of it is at the moment on paper so the specs yeah. so many of the specs are incredible so the 0 to 60 time i understand how they could engineer it the 800 volt system i understand how it's engineered the 350 kilowatt charging i understand how it's engineered but you have to put all those together in one package and get it on sale next year and that's a big question mark in terms of what what as you say normally at a car launch it's then and here's the vehicle. And now you can right. have a poke around and a look around. And then to find out a day or two later, well, one doesn't exist. Uh, you know, uh, a pusher exists. But um, a lot of those pictures that we've been looking at, if you're watching the YouTube version of the podcast, are renders. I mean, fair play to their art department because it looks amazing. I didn't I didn't realize that till I read the article on Inside EVs 36 right. hours later that they were like, okay, we haven't built one yet, but, you know, we will. You're like, oh, my goodness. Like, this is – and that's I think that's the frustration for me with these big, big companies that have got decades of experience of assembling. Right. So they're, they're very, very, very good at putting things together, consumer products together. This is not new for them. This is not hard. Like I get putting it all together in one piece is and getting it to market is a, a challenge, but it's not like they're having to redesign how to make a car, right? Right. It's like even if they made one that only had a fifty kilowatt hour pack, but it was at least a runner that that the media could have uh, well, uh, you know uh, got in and, and I think they have. Did you have a runner? It, oh, it is a runner. Have, there is a runner. Oh, apologies. Yes. I I, uh, I thought I read that they hadn't actually made a runner yet. What? Like this photo is of a real car or a, a real thing. This right. one's not CGI that we're looking at here. I mean, it, I think it does. Uh, it, I don't think it, I don't know if it has full functionality. It, I don't know, you know, if it all works like it's going to yeah. in, in the end. It's it's really a, like a basically a, it's a, a prototype. But it, yeah. it, we, there is, a, I think, on John Redinger's video, he does show uh, GM sent him B roll of someone actually driving it, so you could see oh, that's a real good. human in it, and the thing actually drives, but. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a prototype. It's not like a, a working pre-production, you know, kind of thing. And as I, I said earlier, I, I I'll talk about why I think that's a good thing. If you want to hear that, why? <laughs> Tell us why. <laughs> okay, so the, <laughs> the development process for the Hummer has been shortened. Uh, I think probably a lot of that has to do with COVID, and then just you know, I, I'm not sure um, how 
how long the whole development pro i mean did someone just wake up and say okay we're doing this and but anyway and i'm not sure the actual numbers but it, it's definitely a lot shorter this time we should be seeing you know pre-production vehicles especially at, at the official reveal that's been delayed for like six months or so uh so as i said earlier they yeah they don't have any production intent trucks built just with just a year or so before deliveries so they do have the powertrain in mules and they've been and they've done extent, extensive testing of the battery systems they have like a, a huge battery lab where they do all kinds of incredible amounts of testing they're very sophisticated it's you know it's i've walked to it it's amazing um and they've so and they've also done a lot of development engineering and analysis with computer simulations now this is a good thing because if they learn from this and they use the same approach with other future products it's going to save them a lot of time and money and just some product development in general so this could really unlock you know a lot of like future profit or savings however they want to you know make that calculation in the future if you know if they actually can do it you know um, they've set the target they have to deliver I think before the end of next year is really what they they want to do, and so we'll you know we'll see if they can do that, and then apply that these same lessons to all the other electric vehicles, or the, the Cadillac Lyric, and I mean they're going to have uh, electric vehicles uh, in all the you know in in Buicks and you know, all the other Cadillacs and stuff. So mm. that's my that's my take. I have one point to bring up. Uh, what is up with this 400 to 800 volt switching? Uh, I, have you spoken about this yet? Because I have two thoughts I want to share. Ooh, a little bit, but go ahead. Okay, so the battery pack when you drive is a normal 400 volt system architecture. It yes. then switches from parallel to series and goes to 800 volts. Could be the other way around. I always get those confused. Uh, but it only does this when charging. and. It makes tons of sense. You want the highest voltage possible while charging because, uh, you know, to get 350 kilowatt out of these stations is only possible at 800 or higher volts uh, because they can only dump a certain amount of current in. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the voltage is to match that current for DC chargers typically. And so that seems pretty cool. You drive around a 400 volt system architecture, you stop, you plug it in, ka-ching, some stuff moves in the battery. It's a mechanical connection. Keep in mind that changes and it ups to 800 volts. But I was pretty excited about that. And then five seconds later, I thought about it. I'm like, why isn't it just 800 volts all the time? So I asked GM engineers this uh, yesterday and I said, why? Don't you just leave it at 800 volts? You get better efficiency all around. They said, well, you know, uh, components are, are, are easier to integrate at 400 volt and we're plenty efficient at 400. And that's probably true that they are plenty efficient at 400 volt system architecture. But what it really means is they didn't want to spend the money to engineer an 800 volt architecture for the rest of the car. Sure. They just wanted it for the charging. So it's a blend of cost savings uh, with added complexity to switch your battery pack voltage to make it 800 volts. Personally, I wish they took the Tycon and the Lucid approach and designed it as a higher voltage system, uh, but it's an ingenious way to get around that plan and still get really fast charging. So it's the only 400 volt system architecture that can theoretically charge at 350 kilowatts because it's the first one I've ever heard of that switches. Right. I remember well, it, talking to the Porsche uh, uh, engineers and about this exact same thing, and they were so proud that w of what they had accomplished. And you know, they said, "Listen, you know, we had to engineer ourselves all of these components. Like we're not used to that. You know, we can do it, but we're not used to that. We go to suppliers. There were no, there were no suppliers making any of this stuff. We absolutely. had to, we had to engineer all of the components to work in this." Um, you know, high voltage battery system. So they were really proud about that. The Porsche guys that I that I spoke with back when we did the media drive last year. Well, it's the same yeah. riv same reason Rivian's at 400 volts and everyone else. You can only typically buy components rated up to 600 volts, and you need that 20 percent buffer. Mm -hmm. And uh, off the shelf components, they're just not there from tier one, tier two, <laughs> tier three suppliers to handle that level of voltage. My guess is that they will be available soon because now the suppliers are saying, okay, th there's gonna be a market for this stuff. They're probably all in development now. And I bet yeah. within a couple of years, you'll be able to get anything you need for you know 800 or 900 volt battery systems. And and uh, and that that will make it much easier for the manufacturers to, to put these systems in, in place. 
100 i think by by yep. 2025 350 kilowatts will probably be the de facto standard mm-hmm. i think five years you think well let's hope so wow okay. depends on the battery pack size um yeah you know i i think we'll see a shift at some point to smaller batteries uh, but those don't need uh, 350 kilowatt charging. <laughs> I think I think 150 is the minimum livable charge rate for most people. Yeah. I think right. uh, you really don't need any more than a 150. Even like in, a, in an efficient vehicle, like an ID4 that can do 125, for example, that's not bad. Okay. Um, so is there anything else? There's just a couple more things about the, uh, the Hummer I wanted to hit on real quick. I'm not sure if anyone else has sent something, so let me just run through these real quick. So it also has extract mode, which gives you six inches of additional lift for a total of 15.9 inches. You, the suspension will lift up. Uh, it's got adaptive air suspension. Uh, it's, it's coming with the next generation of Super Cruise, That's the, uh, which is like a autopilot, I guess, basically. With you know differences, but um, and let's see what else. Or oh, it has a one pedal driving, and it has regen paddles on like the Chevy Bolt on, on the steering wheel, so you can use the paddles to uh, get extra regen. And yeah, that's about it for me. Anyone else? No. Okay. So Tesla made history this week. It declared a profit for the third quarter of 2020. And using the generally accepted accounting principles or, or GAAP, uh, its net profit was three hundred and thirty-one million dollars, and that's the that's its fifth profitable quarter in a row. And it was built on a record revenue of eight point seven billion dollars, and that came from the sale of vehicles. It delivered one hundred thirty-nine thousand three hundred cars and produced one hundred forty-five thousand thirty-six vehicles between July and September, and both of those figures are. New, a new all-time record for Tesla. Uh, as usual, critics are saying it was only profitable because of the revenue from <laughs> sales of regulatory credits. That totaled $397 million this quarter, down from $428 million last quarter. Uh, now, if Tesla wanted to declare a quarterly profit and didn't have any credits, it could have just slowed some of its spending on expanding production capacity, of course, uh, service centers and supercharging stations. This this quarter alone, it spent two point four billion dollars on on that on, you know, capital expenditures, and so you know it could easily take some of that. And as well, while we're talking about expenses, it also forked out. Uh, over $543 in stock-based compensations, or SBCs, the lion's share of which went to CEO Elon Musk, who hit the necessary award milestone, so unlocked that cash. And um, I did see some uh, uh, some regulatory filings. It looked like uh, some other high-level executives had some pretty big paydays as far as you know, getting unlocking those uh, stock-based compensations. So... Martin, so is this a great result or is this a great result? <laughs> uh, one of the things that I liked in Elon's opening statement was he um, talked about the the scale of the business and what that allows them to do with the feedback loops. And he compared them to Google. Uh, you know, every every search you make on Google of the billions of searches that happen all the time uh, is that if you if they serve a result that you want at the top and you click on that link, that's a you know positive affirmation that um, that they served you a good result and he compared them to google and of course there is a fleet of a million cars on the road not all of them with full self-driving of course but all of them sending data back to uh, the mothership and you know apart from obviously that if google serves you a terrible search result and you click the back button uh, whereas if if tesla goes wrong you know you hit somebody uh, while driving down the road the stakes are higher uh, but he was still making the point that they have this big fleet and, and that's what i loved about so that in that opening statement about the, the the million cars providing a feedback loop to me set the tone of uh, the shareholder letter and the, and, the, and the call afterwards as well which was you know for me guys having sat with it i, I think there's a maturity of, of the company now five profitable quarters in a row but also if i take away those things that they talked about with the so so the new cells the 4680 form factor cells which are being made on a pilot line which is still going to be one of the 10 biggest cell manufacturing facilities in the world that's going to end up making 10 gigawatt hours of production annualized production a year this time next year when they're up to getting the yield right and you know there's only so many batteries that you can take away and siphon off for semi-truck 
prototypes being built at Fremont. So they confirmed that the, the cells that are being made uh, in, in California will be shipped to Berlin for the first Model Y. So we now know confirmation, and we'd kind of had half confirmation already, but we know more details, that those first Model Ys, which will be entirely different under the hood, you know, they'll look the same, but they'll be made yeah. entirely differently, and um, uh, will be using the new structural battery, the new giant casting machines for the one-piece front end and rear end, and that sort of ties into something that I noticed last night, the... Uh, uh, the Twitter user Green the Only uh, was saying that code has showed up in the in the Model Y for the uh, the HEPA filter bioweapon defense mode, uh, which Elon said would never would never come uh, because there's no room. And all of a sudden you think, well, actually, how have they made room in the Model Y? Well, they've redesigned the car. That they've redesigned the whole front right. single cast piece. So these HEPA filters are about ten times the size of a regular car filter, and there's room in the S and the X to put them in. And you think, well, okay, that that is another sign that it's going to be a wildly different car than the one they're making at the moment in the US and China. And uh, but Elon's saying those cells will be shipped from California to Berlin for the first Model Ys, but don't expect what he called volume production until 2022. Whereas we go back a little bit and the company when they were scaling up model three it really was make or break you know it wasn't quite back in the early days of the company when they were you know struggling to make payroll by the end of the week and elon putting all of his own personal money in but certainly model three was make or break it seems now they got 15 billion of cash and equivalents in the bank they're fine they're not going anywhere and it seems to me that they've just allowed themselves to Kind of mature in this wonderful way rather than saying we've got to get model y's out the door in berlin as quick as possible and if it's got you know we'll we'll get them out now they're saying well look production will start next summer uh but but they'll just be the first vehicles and volume is 2022 and that's very unlike all the things that we've heard before and so it's nice they've set the expectations very low I think they will exceed them, is my personal opinion. I don't think we'll wait that long for it. But that was that was kind of my overall takeaway, having sat and, 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 and thought about it. And, you know, they're spending... This quarter, they spent a billion on capital expenditure, uh, which, you know, if you do that over four quarters, that's four billion a, a year on CapEx. They could easily do five to eight, and, it, it, and they would still be massively profitable. The margins are very big. Um, the annual capacity they confirmed... and the, and Remember, capacity is not production, but right. annual capacity of, of 3 and Y in Fremont alone is now half a million because they've opened up the second paint shop. In Shanghai, it's now 250,000, and that's, that's three only, not Y. Y will be online at the end of the year. So they are... They weren't bullish, but they, they were like, you know, if we can do 180,000 cars, which would be a massive record this quarter, we'll hit half a million this year. And then when one of the analysts asked Elon, you know, could it be between 840 and a million next year? Uh, what was the phrase he used? Not ballpark, uh, not vicinity, but it, it, um, he used a phrase like that. And Okay, in the neighborhood. Like, uh, something like that. And you're like, okay. whoa, okay. So all of a sudden... It's in my notes somewhere here, but um, all of a sudden, you're like, well, here's a company that could make half a million cars this year, and I've just been talking about them you know, maturing, and yet, what mature company does a 100% growth rate year on year? Next year could be a million cars, so really, really positive, um, just absolutely pumped that they are showing, they are proving the case that EVs are a good business decision to do. And, you know, there's the side argument of winners and losers and how much of the market share will Tesla capture and, and the others and catching up and all that kind of stuff. Bum, 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 bum. That will all shake out in the fullness of time. I'm excited because it showed actually they're making a really strong business out of making electric vehicles. Um, and they're not even an EV maker. Like, then that, that's not even their purpose. <laughs> like, they're not even a car company. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the energy energy side, like you said, they're not just a car company. They, they sell energy storage. And so their total battery energy storage, power all, power packs, and mega packs delivered in a quarter increased to 759 megawatt hours in the third quarter. That's up 59% over last year's third quarter, which, yeah. you know, it's All of the, these the, the, the profit margin is a little lower on this. I think it's closer to like nine percent or something. I think I saw the number. We have a we have, we have the article up there on uh, on Inside EVs, but 
Yeah, that's the other big piece of the puzzle. And the margins on something like insurance will be, because they they elaborated on the insurance project, um, and they said that all of the um, enterprise software that Tesla uses, they write themselves. Like this is not a car company. This is a tech. This is a Silicon Valley technology company that ships updates weekly. They're never done. And you know, I think about so many other products that are done. They're finished. They're shipped, and then maybe they get a mid-cycle refresh. Tesla operate like. In fact, Elon said, "We think of ourselves as twelve sort of." 12 plus small right. startups like all the product lines so s3 sec uh, sexy cars so s3 x y c not the atv but r and the s um, like that's seven then you've got fremont nevada berlin shanghai people forget about buffalo um austin so that's 13 to 14 already and then you add in insurance autonomy they make their own chips they make their own silicon they write all their own software this is not a normal car company this is in this is some insane stuff they're doing but coming back to insurance because they write all of their own stuff elon was saying that the margins on the insurance are crazy because they write all their own uh, software they assess all their own risk and they can provide a package of insurance which they want to roll out to everyone which is cheaper than anyone else can provide and a better level of coverage because they know everything about every steering input every pedal movement that you do is logged in the mothership and for good or bad you know for good or bad they can assess what kind of driver you are and and what your policy will cost and he's saying that alone could be 40 percent of the entire automotive business very soon so yeah um super super pumped for it um without getting you know carried away um Cybertruck was definitely um, played down. He was, I was in, I mean, he said, I mean, it was in the design studio with Franz uh, last Friday. He said, and we've made a load of small tweaks, and the Cybertruck you see will be very different to the one that we unveiled. <laughs> Didn't elaborate on that, um, but he did say that you know don't expect it anytime soon they're working on it um right. didn't really address any of the recent upgrades uh to the cars or even the price drops but uh you know there was one omission no mention of the roadster either in the call or the letter uh that will it will it ever arrive <laughs> who really it doesn't really matter does it because it won't add anything to the bottom line just a, bun- a bunch of youtubers who won't get their free car but uh, they'll be very upset will it ever arrive uh, you know they were going to make it as the hardcore smackdown to all other combustion cars but right. you know maybe the model s plaid does that so who knows no, it's it's going to be in it's fremont i guess right it's for the road series that's where it's supposed to be built when it comes there was zero right. mention of it and there, by the way right. there doesn't need to be they can get on and quietly work sure. on it and uh you know and and and, and yeah and good luck there one day and it'll be amazing day, so and it'll right. be wonderful um they also talked about charging yes. of commercial vehicles and they said that they were working with partners on defining a standard um that to me sounds like the uh, charin um uh yes, charin, charin, which is, yeah, is that a european sure. thing but i mean everyone's mm-hmm. in that uh, that's yeah. a um yeah. a group of four gm uh uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, Volkswagen, Tesla, ABB, everyone. Uh, ABB, everyone around that space as well. Um, and so they'll be defining a standard for, you know, one megawatt plus charging right. for commercial vehicles. So they, they alluded to that and said that we are working with partners on a standard and, and that's coming that's along good. nicely. So, uh, That'd again, be great to have a good a standard in, in that, that uh, power range. Oh, God. It, yeah, it was just some good stuff. There was nothing, in, there was nothing announced. There was nothing that... Um, made any mega headlines but all very very solid stuff that should remind you know the rest of the the, you know the car industry that this is the trajectory and if you want to come along for the ride you can make money doing this this is a good business to be in wow martin that's a pretty good uh summation of everything (laughs) anyone have anything else (laughs) well the the only thing i'll I'll add to it is i want to see kyle's insurance estimate from tesla Based Yo, on driving not. patterns, yes we so, do. Yeah, <laughs> yes we, we do. We, we definitely you have to apply for that when it's available yes, and let them let them rate you. Yeah, um, that's that, probably that, not a bad that, idea. That, we that would be that. awesome. Um, Wait, and you the, know what's funny? I don't drive fast on the street, but I will say Geico is so inexpensive to insure my Tesla. My smart car costs more to insure than my Tesla. Don't ask hmm. me why, but it is wow. true. And, and I will strange. add, when, 
when Kyle and I drove from New Jersey to North Carolina in two different cars, when we got to North Carolina, he did make some kind of a comment like, you're definitely from New Jersey because you. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, because Tom just freaking rips it wherever it's like car. <laughs> and then I just see this little mini Cooper SE just rocket off like in traffic. I'm like, damn, this guy's in a hurry. <laughs> Uh, anyway, the uh, last thing that I would like to just add to this is swinging back to the very beginning when we're talking about Tesla only being profitable because of their regulatory credits. Okay, get over it. Who's ever beating those drums? <laughs> because it's profit is profit. It's part of it's 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 revenue that they get, and it's part of the business. Um, yeah. Tesla's been. It's amazing that they're strung five quarters together in a row now. Profitability. No, it, it's not amazing because they just keep selling more cars. But the amazing part is look at what they're doing right now with, with building factories all over the world, expanding the supercharger network that, you know, that they're not letting anyone like Electrify America or Ionity or anybody even get close to them. So, you know, the amount of investment that they're making, they're still in that growth phase. It's ridiculous that they're that 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 they've that they've been profitable now five quarters in a row. It's just amazing, and you know what? Uh, the regulatory credits are there. Anybody can get those. Any company out there that that wants to make a ton of zero emission vehicles could could get that revenue. Uh, it just yeah. so happens that Tesla's the one that's that that's raking in most of the money from that. So um, you know, kudos to Tesla. That this is a great accomplishment. Five, stringing five consecutive quarters in a row of profitability. Yeah. It's 146 new stations with 100 or 1,337 connectors in the last three months that were added to the supercharged network. And, and, and to that, to that point now, to, look, you know, we talk a lot about Luxify America, Kyle and I cover Luxify America a lot. We've given them a lot of credit for how they've expanded so much recently. I mean, the last uh, announcement, the last announcement that Luxify America had a few months back was that they now have 400 charging stations with something like 15 or 1600 connectors. Tesla has now almost 20,000 connectors. So they they're literally have 10 times the amount of physical plugs than Electrify America does. And, you know, we, we can't, you know, we can't uh, discount that, that Tesla hasn't let their foot off the accelerator. They are just continuing to install these worldwide at a, at a breakneck pace. So, I mean, you know, you've got to give them credit for this. And it's such an integral part of Tesla's business plan. You know, it's, you know, the fact that they're selling so many cars and installing so many supercharger stations isn't mutually exclusive. You know, it's, it's why they're selling so many cars. Every time a new car comes out, like the Lucid, um, we didn't really talk about charging too much with the Hummer EV, but everybody says, oh, you know, the Lucid charges at 350 kilowatts. It's amazing. Then what do you get in the comments? Yeah, but there's nowhere to charge it. You know, so like, and it's true to an extent that the, the DC fast charge infrastructure is expanding um, compared to what it was four or five years ago, but it, it's still, there's nothing like the charging experience of owning a Tesla. It is, you, you can't even compare it at this point. Right. All right. So are we, are we ready to move on? We've got uh, we're just about 10 minutes or so before our time's up. We might go a little over. Who knows? Um, so there's another big headline this week. Uh, Tesla has released it, a new full self-driving beta to a select handful of owners. Um, we're not sure exactly. So supposedly to, you know, careful drivers, but there's a couple... Uh, higher profile, at least one higher profile account that has it, and we've already seen videos out on, out there, you know, showing it off. So, uh, despite its name, uh, full self driving, no one should be under the illusion that it's actually full self driving. It still requires the drivers to be paying attention and keep, keeping their hands on the wheel. Uh, the first videos of this of the system in action are already out, and it looks pretty promising. Uh, for these first beta testers, the screen animation shows. Kind of things, kind of how the computer sees them, and it'll it'll look more normal, I think, once it's rolled out to everybody else. And if we, I don't know if we have one there, Martin, that we can show people. But uh, uh, so now with FSD activated, you can you have uh, like the smart cruise control and auto steer like before. It can read speed limit signs better and stop stop signs and red lights. So the big improvement, 
you know, the big, big improvement is that it can actually make left or right turns now through intersections by itself. And this morning I even saw there's a video out of it going through a roundabout. So that's pretty cool. Um, so once Tesla decides uh, FSD is actually up for the challenge, it will be rolled out to other owners who have paid for the privilege, uh, maybe even before the end of the year. So that's pretty neat. And uh, speaking of paying, Elon announced on Twitter that the price of FSD is going up again by $2,000 to $10,000 for this. Uh, and that's to happen on Thursday of next week. It was originally Monday. You got some pushback. Uh, um, and countries outside of the U.S., it will come out. Uh, the the price rain, the price raise will happen after beta is rolled out in those other regions. Um, yeah, that's that's worth saying that we don't have a version right. of 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 uh, full self driving like you do anywhere near. Right, and so yeah, so the price will stay, I guess, what it is now, and then increase once its capability increases. Um, Oh, yes. And here is something new, too, that we just suggested uh, last week and maybe prior to. I think we've talked about this, but a monthly full self-driving rental will be available to owners sometime next year. So, Kyle, you do a lot of long distance driving and don't have SD, don't have FSD. Um, will you be renting it next week or next year? Uh, it's possible. Look, I think autopilot for my use case, which is just sitting on the highway and eating, you know, 5,000 miles in a week, that is, um, it already does a really good job of that. Really, the only thing I want is lane changes out of this. Now, thankfully, we still have a car in our family with FSD. So okay. that's probably the car that we'll use in the future if we do any more of these long distance trips. But my personal car does not. Um, this is a really interesting upgrade. I am, first off, very excited that we're seeing more of the capability of autopilot. Uh, and I put a poll out on Twitter, and it was pretty controversial yesterday, about uh, do you feel that it is safe that Tesla tests its systems, 100% testing, on general average consumers? Uh, and so, you know, we got an 80% yes. Most of my followers that, that I'm in contact with are very Tesla loyal and 20% no. And I don't even have sort of a, a solid opinion here. I was just curious what everyone thought. Uh, but I will bring up two things. One, on the side of that, yes, this is safe. Uh, many people feel that you need this system to uh, be put in the real world with real users, and that's the only way it's going to learn and get better for this type of system. The other side, the unsafe side of this, which I tend to lean a little bit more to, and I'll explain why in a second, um, is I believe, uh, and many others, that this is testing premature technology on users that are untrained in how the system works. For the people that have the initial rollout, they're probably super into Tesla, they're keeping their hands on the wheel, they know when to take over. But maybe that's only exciting for the first 10 or 11 hours of driving, and then you're like, oh, the car's got it. And then what happens when the car doesn't have it? And certainly humans mess up too, I'm not trying to say that right. you know we need to wait until this technology is perfect, but I think there needs to be some more clear communication from Tesla to the users of the system of the true limitations of the system. Uh, you know, can it, does it have trouble seeing in the dark and fog and recognizing a pedestrian? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't have an issue, but I feel like two lines of text saying you're required to pay attention is not enough to safely roll out this level of capability in such an early stage. I mean, that Tesla is saying this is early release and we're testing it on the general public. So uh, while I think it's a very cool, exciting technology, it seems to do a really good job of making left turns, right turns, handling tight scenarios. I actually haven't seen a scenario that it has not handled yet. Uh, it's been very impressive. I just think I wish I would see a little bit more customer education on the system, especially for those who are testing it out for the first time. Yeah, they still have the um, the disclaimer. So if you are in the, the beta program and you activate it, you still get the disclaimer s s come up on screen, which says, or, or rather the instruction, which is, you know, you've signed an agreement uh, to, uh, you know, not discuss these things. You're part of a program. But then they've added a line at the bottom of it. Um, you're welcome to talk about this on social media. Um, and it's that one addition to the to that, dis and I'm like, 
uh, okay. Like, again, this is a safety. This is the ultimate. Sa this is not about a wrong click on Google. This is about running someone over. And and I, I don't know if, if, like, the point of this is meant to be that Twitter owned, the, the, the Tesla owned Twitter this week. Like, the point of this is getting it right and being an amazing technology, not about make sure you tweet about it, guys. Cars. Like, that was. That was an interesting line to add in, and I don't know how much or not to read into it, but I'm like, I read that and was like, oh, asking people to tweet about it? Oh, okay. Like, this is a safety thing. It's I don't know very if be odd uh, how they're doing this rollout. And again, d don't get me wrong. I love the technology. I can't wait to spend some more time with it and figure out its intricacies and watch the system expand and mature over time. Um, but yeah, Martin, it, it just seems uh, like they're really, we haven't heard much of a true focus on safety with uh, this type of technology from Tesla. Also, it still really bugs me that they call it FSD. It's not FSD. The car still needs a human there to be engaged 100% of the time. And people are like, oh, FSD is here. I'm like, no, it's not full self-driving. It's really amazing driver assistance, but it's not driving right. itself because it's not safe sure. without you in the car. Therefore, it cannot be driving itself without a human paying attention. And, and it's going to be quite some time until the uh, you know cars can drive themselves with humans not paying attention and then with no humans at all. So right. um, you know, it's going to be quite, quite an interesting time. Do, do we I know mean, how it, many people receive this? No, we, we don't even have an idea. Like, is I, it, I, don't, I, don't, 20, I think it's pretty is small. It 10? Is it, you know, so yeah. Um, yeah. I think I, I, the... Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no. Um, you know, the, it'll be interesting to see how that gets expanded, uh, you know, and, and what the timeline of expanding that is. If like, let's say in 30 days, there's no incidents, you know, which I'm sure they're, they're, you know, really hoping that there's not an incident there's going to be an incident sooner or later let's face it i mean somebody is gonna there's so many in instances where things are just unpredictable and the, the it's obviously not ready you know it's not polished and done or they would have just right. been a full release uh so I, I i wonder if tesla has like i'm sure they do some sort of plan where okay if in 30 days we've logged you know a hundred thousand miles on these 10 cars that are out there or whatever and uh, and uh there's no instances, then we'll, we'll, we'll give it to 50 more people or something like that. I, I just wish that Tesla would communicate what the plan was. You know, they wouldn't because God forbid, like the first day this gets released, there's a problem. Then, you know, it's, it would get completely pulled back. Um, and I hope that nobody gets hurt. Uh, there's gonna, It's just inevitable. There's going to be an incident. Uh, hopefully it's a minor incident where a car just, you know, brushes into another vehicle or a garbage can or whatever, something, an obstruction in the road that it doesn't see. And it's not a per, it's not a person, but we're, we're going to be talking about this on the podcast at some point. Um, you know, unless Tesla for some reason ends it, uh, because it's, it's inevitable. I just hope somebody doesn't get, you know, hurt yet. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm kind of torn both ways. I, I do believe that this, this, the only way that this is going to advance quickly is doing something like this. But I also understand that it, it, it should have been, in my opinion, the, the, the small group of people that are using it should have not just been, you know, Tesla vloggers. You know, mm. it, it should have been, you know, you know, 40 or 50 people that are, you know, uh, you know, it, it trained to do this, or you should have had to go and do a, a week long course with Tesla or something where they explain everything to you, show you in and out, not just like, here you go, guys, uh, you know, have at it, unless it's much better than we believe, you know, and that it's much more further advanced than I think we're kind of thinking it is at this point. But, uh, right. you know, this is something that we, we're, we're definitely going to have to keep a close eye on because this, this is going to be an ongoing story for us yeah my, yeah, my the, concern the, is is on on the regulatory issues around it as well because as i mentioned it's 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 hobbled here so navigate so it, it's sort of in three tranches really the first is all the basic safety stuff that comes with tesla which is just you know standard on a premium car on many cars now um then you've got uh what they call autopilot similar language to, to what you have and i think it, it might even be the same spec so it's basically um uh cruise uh, so adjusted cruise control and uh, lane keep assist, which again, most good 
cars have, premium cars have, and that's probably some of the best in the business in terms of the lane keep is awesome. And then over here, full self-driving, which is over six grand, um, you can't use smart summon. Um, you have to be within six meters, 10 feet of your car to use summon, uh, which is kind of pointless unless... You know, it's in a deep puddle, unless you're less able-bodied. I'm not saying it hasn't got uses. Um, it's not worth six grand. Um, and I'll navigate on autopilot. It, it, won't, it won't do anything but uh, ask you to confirm it on the uh, indicator. So it'll change lanes if you tell it to change lanes. But that's a very different product to what is about to cost 10 grand where you are. That's because over here and in Europe... There is a big conversation going on with uh, in and around the regul sort of the regulators of this, and there are many many voices uh, offering caution, which is good. Um, and there's no doubt that Tesla, as a as a leader in terms of the amount of publicity and PR that they can garner for themselves, could influence the conversation if it goes wrong. And so again, I you know I'm kind of on the side of as, as Kyle says, just let's just proceed with caution um and make sure that we don't kind of shoot ourselves in the foot here and then someone sees a terrible incident or something and then uh, regulators over here are like okay let's slow this down for a couple of years and we'll look into it we'll do some tests because that would be a real shame to keep what is very good safety technology away from people yeah right. because it's at a, the end of weird. the day it comes down to customer education and communication from the company i'm not saying that this uh system would be safe or unsafe uh in and of itself i'm not judging its capability i'm judging the drivers of the systems uh wherewithal uh paying attention you know just being involved enough to take over in time to avoid a potential accident that the system has set itself up for uh you know many times i'm driving in poor weather icy snowy rain whatever it is and the system just shuts off because it can't see i don't know if there's a software way around blinding the cameras so uh you know i i this is something where the car is physically blinded by ice and snow you just need uh the the biggest problem here is not the system it's not the rollout it's not the capability of what autopilot can do it's not the cars it is purely the person behind the wheel understanding uh, truly how to take over in a situation because if you're texting and not paying attention which is so easy to do and you look up in a split second the car's beeping at you saying i'm driving off the road please help me uh you know do you have that bandwidth to assess the situation and accurate accurately correct the car's path without over correcting by the way right. in like a split second time so this is this is where we're at right now we're going to go through this stage we're going to have to go through this stage but Tesla could do a lot more to make it a better transition for drivers. Yeah, communication is not the Tesla's strong point, I don't think. Um, but uh, to some of your points, uh, so this being rolled to the beta testers now, but Tesla itself has its own you know, employees testing this for, for months they've been driving this. So they have some idea of its capability, really. And it and it's always learning and improving. And it will continue. They, they have a... You know what they call was it dojo like a machine learning to teach auto i mean to teach fsd things and it, that hasn't even come online so it, it's going to improve in incrementally over over time it's going to always get better and uh yeah and we have seen actually it's uh, it will stop now for pedestrians uh, there's an example of it online you mm -hmm. can see it it stops you know dead stop and in plenty of like a lot of time almost embarrassingly a lot of time <laughs> and then but that'll be all refined uh, i'm really kind of curious as to, as to how how many people think it's worth ten thousand dollars i mean that's to me is like a, it's a non non-starter i'm not paying ten thousand dollars so something else can drive my car um you know even if i wanted to use it as a self-driving taxi i mean this is just a lot of money if and not more. when when competition well, comes out yeah, and it's going to come out it's goes but when competition comes out those these numbers are going to come crashing down it's going to be you know it's eventually it's going to get cheaper as competition filters into this arena but uh but if we we're a little over time so i want to hit a couple a few more things here but if anyone's got more points to raise about this real quick well, I, all it is about the price, it was raised from 7 to 8K in anticipation of more features. And now that they're here, they're raising it to 10. Uh, but I'm not here to stop someone from selling something for whatever they want. People sure. will buy it at 10K. You're all, I think it's fine. Uh, will I buy it for 10K only if they let me transfer it to another vehicle? That's the thing. Right. Uh, right. I just want it to my account, not to my car. 
Do you um, would you would you want to try it first? Because it seems that that they have unleashed something to a bunch of influencers. Twenty four hours later, Elon's said, "Right, get your wallets out. Uh, you got till Monday, and then under a bit of pushback or for whatever reason, you got till Thursday." But like, I don't know. I'm not saying that I don't make purchasing decisions like everybody else you know like you buy stuff online sometimes and you didn't think it fully through but that might be 50 pounds or 100 pounds like i i can't get my head around spending 10,000 pounds on something which i've never tried and i can't try like they have taken away there used to be a a, a trial period right uh -huh. i don't know not i'm not a tesla owner but couldn't you try it for like a week or a month before Depending you on the time of the, if they ran that program, if they wanted to sell numbers, but you're absolutely right, Martin. The thing is, you're logical. Most people are not, and just not the best. <laughs> well, I don't and about that. Well, think about all the people that leased a car in 2016 with full self-driving, returned it on the lease, and got zero benefit for that extra added yeah, package. Right. Yeah, full self-driving is not factored into the trade-in price at all. So that is simply money that you are loaning or you've given to a company that you are, that you want to support that you believe in. There's absolutely no financial reason uh, and, uh, logical right. reason why you should have bought this years ago and we don't yet know how the subscription service is going to pan out because if it's an attractive s system why would anybody pay you know 10 it's 10,000 now when they roll it out and it's polished and, and everybody can get it you know the price will go up even further why would anybody pay for that if 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 Tesla makes an attract unless they're going to just use the car all the time as like a robo taxi. Why would why would anybody pay for that? Now the, the funny thing about it is the the this subscription service. I had said for ages that Tesla wouldn't do this, even though people said that they were eventually going to. For that single reason, because I I didn't understand why Tesla would roll that out because it would it would cannibalize the sale of of autopilot like. Why would anybody pay that? 10,000, 12,000, 15,000, whatever it's going to be when it's really fully ready and and uh, and offering it to everybody. So, uh, but I was wrong on that 100% and they're rolling something out, but we, we don't know the details yet. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's great. I, I think it's a great offering, uh, but it's a little perplexing why Tesla would do that and then think people will still buy autopilot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if I could, if I could get it for if I could get it for a month when I'm doing some road trips over summer holidays for a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, like yeah, I'll do that because then I haven't got to spend ten grand. Me too. There's, like, but is there going to be a minimum? There's got to be a minimum subscription to it, like three or six months. But if it's monthly, like Elon tweeted last night, um, FSD monthly rental will be available sometime next year. It it cannot be by the month because nobody would then pay. And everyone who has paid would be like, would be really pissed. Like, what yeah. did I do? Yeah. What did I do? Um, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I'd love it did to you? be monthly because that's what I would do. I would then, I, I, I would then just take it for the, the months of the year when I'm doing road trips. Mm -hmm. And then, especially in a post COVID world where we're all traveling in theory a bit less, uh, there's no reason to be out of pocket. Yeah. That's why I didn't think that they were going to do it. So I'm yeah. glad to see that they are going to offer a product like that. Uh, but I'm I'm surprised in the same te at the same time. If it is just monthly, I mean, I think that's absolutely fantastic. You know, and 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 I could absolutely see myself doing it when I go on long when I go on long road trips or just to show off to my friends every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So are, are we ready to move on real quick? Just want to hit a couple of things before we before we end. Uh, so this is kind of a big deal. Uh, General Motors, uh, it's the largest is largest factory in North America is a Spring Hill facility in Tennessee, and they are investing two billion dollars in renovations to you know to convert some of that to EV con uh, EV uh, manufacturing. Uh, it will continue to build the gas-powered Cadillac XT5 and XT6, but the it makes the Acadia as well, and that will be shifted to Lansing, Michigan. And so, yeah, GM continues to invest a lot of money, and you know, man, I'm not sure. And people st still have a hard time believing that they're you know serious about electrification, but man, they are serious about electrification is coming, it's happening. And I don't know if anyone has anything to say about that, but if not, I can move on. 
it's an, another thing. Okay. Uh, so $53,990. That's the price of the XC40 Recharge P8 from Volvo. There it is there, looking black and beautiful. And looks good. It's nice. I love seeing these things. There's gas-powered versions of these on the road, and it's a big seller, actually, for them. And they, they look great. Um, so with destination charges added and the federal tax credit subtracted because if you're paying over fifty thousand dollars for a car you you're probably going to get that kind of uh tax credit back or close to it so that would be forty seven thousand four hundred and eighty five dollars which is a little below i believe the tesla model y long range uh, kyle what do you think of this price because i know you were interested in this yeah, I think it's priced uh, very well. I, I have no issues with it. It's a premium car priced at a relatively premium price. Keep in mind, small. It's not XC60 size. It's still the entry level Volvo yes. SUV. I think uh, you know, in Colorado, this car is forty-three grand or forty-four oh, really? grand uh, base price. I think we optioned ours up a bit. Uh, the way that we're going to spec it in that sage green with uh, you know the driver assistant stuff, and it turned out to be just under. Uh, $50,000 after the tax credits are factored in. Um, Colorado gets an extra $4,000 yes. point of sale credit, which is very nice. Similar to Jersey, gets a $5,000 credit. Um, yeah, I, it's a great car, uh, no issues. I think the range will turn out to be a non-issue as well. I think we'll see it uh, perform quite well in our tests on the highway. And yeah, we, we uh, initially uh, loving this car. Can't wait to drive it, can't wait to uh, see it more. I've spent, again, some time in person with it, with the Google UI, it's very good. And uh, I think it's the, there's so many people my age, friends my age that are not car people that love this car. I know of three or four individual people that are again, my age and they're, they're mid to late twenties and they're like waiting for this to come out and this is going to be their first EV just because it fits the stylish nature. It's premium, but it's not pretentious. I, I, I want to add my two cents. So Kyle talked about New Jersey rebate and this, this actually will qualify for it. It just qualifies. We have a $55,000 cap and with the $995 destination charge, the base price on it is for uh, $54,985. So it clears it by $15. However, then you can't get any options, not even the hundred dollar lava carpet option, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, and in New Jersey, we have no sales tax on beds. So I could literally drive out of the showroom at, with this with a cost of under $43,000 without even negotiating off the MSRP. So, you know, you, you, there's a good chance if you didn't get any options here in New Jersey, you could drive one, one of these home for like forty one or 42000 total, which is a fantastic deal for that vehicle. Yeah. And if you can afford to get the, I don't know if you can see how much it costs, but the uh, the stereo upgrade option, the Harman, I believe it's a Harman Kardon system. It's yep. What, like if, if that, speakers, Harman, man. Oh, that Harman Kardon system costs $5,800 in New Jersey. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and, but you know, the thing is, it's just the HK system. Volvo has a Bowers and Wilkins system in their 60 and 90 series chassis cars. And those are incredible. We, you know, we're in the yeah. process of looking for a V60 plug-in hybrid right now, a Polestar. And uh, thankfully, they all come specced with Bowers and Wilkins. And it has to be one of the best systems. I've listened to, to B&Os and BMWs. I've listened to the Mercedes high-end ones. I've listened to Lexus. Uh, Mark Levinson stuff. This is the best sound systems in any new cars. Uh, you know, it comes at a price like a four thousand dollar option, but totally worth it. Right. Okay. Um, so let's move on real quick. We're yeah, we're way over time. So Neo's flagship sedan is teased. It's uh, called the EE Seven. Uh, it was teased on its mobile app. You can see it on uh, Inside EVs. Maybe we can pull up a picture of it real quick. But it looks pretty good. It looks, yeah, is it, it's like uh, the Neo design language in sedan form, basically. And it's probably going to be a, a, a real, uh, probably have a, you know, a really good high performance. And see, and that only goes on sale in 2022. So we'll we'll have lots of time to talk about that coming up. Uh, this, so this is also really kind of neat. This week, I learned that the uh, Tesla is exporting made in China Model 3s to over 10 countries in Europe. Um, yeah, I just kind of never expected that. 
because originally, you know, the, the made in China Model 3s were for the Chinese market and possibly like surrounding areas like, uh, I don't know, Australia or, or Japan or, you know, other you know places in that region. But, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not sure why it's in Europe, but it is. And yeah, we'll, we'll keep our, our eye on that and see if we can find out more about it. And also this morning we found out that uh, sticking with China, that the Model S uh, has been recalled in China uh, 29,193 units of Model S and Model X is produced between September 17, 2013 and August 16, 2017. Uh, due to some, I uh, see, Tesla will replace the rear linkages of the left and right front suspension and the upper linkages of the left and rear suspension. So that's kind of interesting. And we'll see, uh, we'll see, that, see how that shakes out over here because people have talked about there's been some suspension breakages i'm not sure if, it, if it's the exact same parts here that are involved but uh that, that's something i was just breaking this morning that i wanted to bring up and we'll look into it and w there'll be more about that on uh, inside of ease or maybe here next week so that brings us to the end of our show uh, thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comment section below if you're watching us on YouTube, or on the Inside EVs podcast thread. Now, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tom Log. You can see it on the screen here. Uh, Martin is at EV News Daily. Uh, Kyle is at Out of Spec. There you see it. And I am Dominic underscore Y. And you click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao. <laughs>